Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, it's the first Sunday of the year. It's the first Sunday of the month. So uh, this will be a special uh, Sunday for all of us. Uh, hopefully, we will all be blessed uh, for the message for today. Uh, okay, so let's start. Again, welcome back to our Sunday live uh, worship service, face to face. I hope this will continue. Uh, hopefully, and again, I, as I mentioned, it's the second second day of the year. It's January twenty January two twenty twenty two now. Okay, it's the first Sunday, and uh, today, as we look forward to starting this year, allow me to complete uh, the Ephesians sermon series that we started a couple of weeks ago. Remember, I started uh, the book of Ephesians several Sundays. And today we'll, we'll end our series in the last chapter, which is chapter 6. Remember, Ephesians only have 6 chapters. And we're going to focus on the last session from the entire book. We'll be reading through some of the last few instructions of the Apostle Paul to the Ephesian church before he ends his letter to them. So if you have your Bible with you, yeah, Ephesians chapter 6. So if you have your Bible with you, I'd like to invite you all to open it. And please stand up uh, for giving reverence to the reading of God's Word. Let's open it on Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 13. So we'll use this as our inspirational verse. We're going to read it first, then we will try to find meaningful lessons from it. So this is how it says on my uh, version. It says in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. So let us now come to the Lord and offer this message in a word of prayer first. Our Heavenly Father God, Lord, once again, we would like to thank you for this opportunity that we could gather together face to face to worship you, to listen to your word, Lord God. I just pray, Lord God, that you will be the one to deliver your word. Speak to us, Lord God, speak to our hearts. And give us inspiration, Lord God, for this coming year. We thank you, Lord God, and we trust everything to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So you may now be seated. Again, the title of our message. Oops. Uh, okay, yeah. Again, the title of our message is Winning the Battle. Standing for Spiritual Warfare. And today, as we conclude our last portion of our sermon series, our objective is first to understand and realize what we are all about to face. Okay, so there, there will be something that we're going to face this year. And secondly, to know the things we need to learn and understand the things we need to do and carry. Okay, so probably would ask me, Kuya or Pastor Adele, what, what is that that we need to do? What do we need to do and what do we need to carry? So later on, we will find out. So, but before we jump straight to our lesson proper, uh, let me just make a quick review of what we have uh, discussed from the previous week. So far, we have covered three sermon lessons already. I hope you still remember. First, we have, you know, uh, we had this from chapter one. We have the sermon pertaining our identity in Christ, where we learn the principles and the doctrine of Christian faith. Then we jump into chapter 4 in our second sermon entitled, The Road to Change, where we look at the calling of God for each one of us to answer the call for us to be changed. From there, we learn uh, the things we need to stop, things we need uh, for us to be ready, and things that we need before we go. Remember, we list out all those practical recommendations that Paul enumerated from chapter 4, verses 17 to 32. So I'm just simply giving you some uh, review or a recap. 
And last week, this is what we discussed last week, right? I hope you still remember. This is our third sermon on the book of Ephesians entitled, Walking the Challenge. And uh, this we cover in chapter 5. We pick up three important things from Paul, right? We said that in order to face the challenge for the coming year, uh, we then need to learn and understand the things as he, number one, uh, as he charged the Ephesians to be on the side of love, right? Number two, as he conditioned them to be the light and be in the light. Okay? And lastly, as he cautioned them to be uh, to live wisely. So those are the things that we have already covered on the book of Ephesians. Chapter 1, chapter 4, chapter 5, and today we'll jump to chapter 6. Right? And now that we know and learn the principles and doctrine and from chapter 1, now that we see the need for change and are ready for upcoming challenges, which we learned from previous message, let us now get ourselves ready to prepare ourselves for war. Are you ready to face war? Or are you ready to face the battle? Okay, I'm talking about the spiritual warfare that is set before us. Do you believe that every one of us is facing a battle day by day? Yes. Now, as we dig into the passage, we will try to understand and extract lessons that will help us get through to our own individual battles, right? And as I mentioned from my previous message, I'm hoping that after somehow understanding the concept of the whole letter of Paul to the Ephesians, we could, do, we could then be able to know the things we need to know as we continue with our lives this year and also for the coming years ending every year triumphantly and victoriously so we want to end year after year victorious right who wants to be a loser nobody right so let me start my message those are just a review or those are just a recap let me start it with my preposition okay now there is a saying that knowledge is a wonderful thing, especially when you know it in advance, when we receive information ahead of time, right? If you, have, if you know the future or what go, what's going to take place ahead of time, then it's an advantage. You like the feeling of knowing what will happen, right? Look at this. Oh, come on. Ah, yeah, name the body. There you go. <laughs> when, when I'm watching a Pacquiao fight, I, I think everyone is familiar with Pacquiao, I, nor I normally find my reaction differently when I watch it in a replay compared to a live fight. As I already knew what is going to happen in the end, right? So when I'm watching it on a replay, I find it more relaxed. You know, despite of the mishap in the middle of the bout, I am confident that in the end, Pacquiao will end up winning. Because I already knew in advance, I already have a free knowledge of what will go to happen. You know, compared to watching it live, it certainly changes the way I relate to it. You know, it basically gives me some sort of confidence because I already know. You know, unlike in, you know, in live or actual performance that I am not aware. You know that what might take place you know most of the time I called it heart pounding you know when I was watching Pacquiao live you know my heart is really pounding because I don't know what's going to happen right it's different it's very uncertain stressful and unrelaxing so what's the point point? and this is exactly what I would like us to see as we study the passage today it is not God has only pre-informed us about the things that will take place in our lives, but also He made us aware where it is leading to. And where is the end result? Victorious, right? That, that is the end result. So, so as we go through this passage, I'd like us to read and understand it in such a way that we are like watching a replay. So as we study this, you know, let's put our mindset as if that we're watching a replay. That in the end, we already know what's going to happen. So again, today, allow me to divide the passage into three sections. 
so that we could all clearly see uh, what I'm referring to. Uh, we'll use these three points as the main body of our study for today's message entitled Winning the Battle, Standing for Spiritual Warfare. So that is just only my introduction. So the big question now is, how do we win the battle? How do we win the war? Right? That's the big question right now. And with that question in mind, I have three practical ways based on the text that we have read. So I have three suggestions based on the, the text that we have read a while ago. So I'll jump into it immediately so I will not lose much time. Number one, uh, in order to win the battle, we need to understand the summon. Okay, when we, when we say summon, it, it's the call or it's the instruction. And that is to stand firm. Okay? So it says there in verse 19. Okay, let's see. It's not operating. Yeah, there you go. What? Okay, so it, it, it says on verse 10, I mean. Uh, it says there, Finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Look at this. Put on the full armor of God so that you could take your stand against the, de the devil's scheme. Okay? It says there, Put on the uh, full armor of God so that you could take your stand against the devil's scheme. You know, in the initial passage we read, we could observe that God through the Apostle Paul is telling them and us now three times to stand firm. We could see that on verse 11, right? I hope you could see it. And also we could see that on verse 13 and also 14, the word to stand or stand your ground, stand firm, okay? Uh, he was saying that we have to be firm and not move even though there are things happening around us. No, we have to remain regardless of anything that will shake us up. Though uh, he urged us to remain and be stable. That is the summon. Okay? That is the call. That is the urge for us to remain and not to move. Why? Because he's reminding them and again us now of a battle or a fight that we are all the part of. Actually, you could see on verse 12, it says there, uh, okay, here, on verse 12, it says that, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, okay, so there's, there's a fight, right? But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, okay? So Paul is basically describing us and telling us that everything visible and everything physical is preceded by something invincible and spiritual. Okay, let me repeat that. So you, uh, I hope you, you catch that. That everything visible, everything that you see around here, everything that is physical is preceded by something invincible and spiritual. It says they're not against flesh and blood, which is physical, but rather it is spiritual in heavenly realm. Meaning that everything that seems happening in the physical world has something to do with the spiritual world. There are two worlds, the spiritual and the physical, right? And they are connected, they are tied up together. And therefore, if we want to address the visible physical result or effect, we must then identify and address the invincible spiritual cause. Now he is saying that the physical is tied up or influenced by the spiritual. And without identifying the invincible spiritual root, meaning the root cause, we will then be going to be thrown out by own, uh, our own visible spiritual root, meaning the result. Okay? I've been saying, you know, invisible, visible, spiritual, physical. So basically what, what Paul is saying here is that if you don't know what is happening on the spiritual world, you will be losing on the physical world. So you need to understand what is happening on the, on the spiritual so that you could win the battle on the physical. So basically that is what Paul is saying there. He is saying that it is not against flesh and blood, it is not against physical, but it is in the heavenly, which is the spiritual. 
And that is why he is stressing us and urging us to summon the summon of God. And that is to stand firm. And that is the reason why. Because Paul understands that it is not physical. It is spiritual. And that's the reason why he is summoning us. He is urging us to what? To stand firm. Okay? That's the main idea. Why do we... What is, what is the call? Or what is the summon? It is for us to stand firm. And how did Paul summon them uh, for standing firm? Look at number one. The summon of God to stand firm. Number one. Uh, there we go. Uh, to stand firm, Christian needs to be strong. We need spiritual strength. Where can we find that? On verse 10. Look at what he said. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Okay? So in order for us to, to, st to stand strong or to, to stand firm, we need the strength from the Lord, the spiritual strength. You know, after telling us the principles about who we are in the Lord, in, in, in chapter 1, after giving us instruction to walk the change and the challenge, here comes Paul now preparing us for the main event. He have come now to the peak of his letter and he said, look at that, finally, right? So meaning everything that he has written from the previous chapter, when he comes to chapter 6, he said, finally, Meaning, this is the main thing that you need to understand. After reading chapter 1 up to chapter 5, when I went to chapter 6, you know, I was stunned with that word, finally. Because there is some sort of like a stress. And then he said, we need strength. You know, it is important for us to understand that we need to draw strength from the Lord. That we should be allied with Him. Acknowledging that our strength is not sufficient especially for this kind of battle it is not only through uh, it is only through his strength that we can totally rely on him we need to understand and accept the fact that our physical strength will be no match on the spiritual realm and it is only through the strength of the lord that we all can win so regardless of how much physical strength that we use in, 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 in this uh, spiritual battle, we, get, we, we don't have much to the enemy. And uh, that is something that we need to understand. And being strong in the Lord basically means, listen to this. What do we mean by being strong in the Lord? It means knowing and using all the power that we have given each one of us. It's not only about knowing it, but more importantly, using it. Okay? So God is saying through us, Apostle Paul, that we need His strength. That is in order for us to stand firm. Number two, what else? To stand firm, Christian needs to be suited. Right? A while ago, I said Christian needs to be strong. Now, Christian needs to be suited. We need spiritual suit. Okay? It says there in verse 11 and also in verse 13. It says there, put on the full armor of God. Okay, in verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God. That is how we stand firm. Okay? You know, I highlight the word put on. You see that, right? I put it on, on, on all caps. You know, uh, because the idea is that God has given each one of us spiritual gears and tools we need for battle. But listen to this. He never put it on to each one of us. Why? Because the Lord wants us to respond and to cooperate with Him. Right? He, he did not, okay, here's, here's the gear. I'll put it on you. No. The Lord said, here's the gear. Put it on yourself. Because He wants each and every one of us to participate and to coordinate. You know, same true in our life. Unless we cooperate with God, we will never inherit the benefits of what we already have. We might have all the gears and tools and whatever the Lord can provide, but unless we do it or we put it on ourselves, it's not. It's going to end meaningless. You know, one of the sad realities that many people listen to this are waiting on God, but never realizing that God had already answered in advance. The only thing we need to do is cooperate and ask. We need to put it on, right? Because it's already there. 
you, our family is all us is waiting for someone to put it on us. And that, that is not how the Lord expected from us. It says that, that in order for us to be ready when the days of evil comes, actually the day of evil technically means this is the day of temptations and attacks from the enemy. Though every day he attacks us, you know, there are certain days that he deliver a much rougher days, right? Uh, some, some days it's so hard, some days are so easy, right? But we know that the enemy is always attacking us. So we need to put on the armor of God, our spiritual suit. And that is for us to stand firm, okay? Later on, we'll discuss about the full armor of God. Right now, we're just studying how to stand firm. And lastly, this is what he said. To stand firm, Christians need to see, okay? Three S. The first one is to be strong. The second one is to be suited. And the third one is to see through. We need a spiritual sight. Look at verse 12 again. Oops, sorry. Look at verse 12 again. It says there, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power of dark, dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So Paul is simply saying that we need to see it in the spiritual perspective. Okay, there is another uh, paradigm that we could call. Uh, this is the, the physical paradigm, the earthly paradigm. But we have to look at it in the spiritual paradigm. That's why Paul is saying, you know, this is not what you are, you know, this is not the struggle. But this is the struggle. He is trying to help us identify it. And this is what I was telling that we need to see. It is a spiritual perspective. You know, that everything visible and physical is preceded by something invincible and spiritual. That even though some people might look like they're doing some evil acts, we have to realize that underlying it is that there is the enemy trying to deceive them. Okay? We need to learn to distinguish, to evaluate things according to the spiritual realm. And knowing that our ability or inability to address the unseen will determine how successful, victorious, empowered, and authoritative we are in the visible realm. Okay? So, did you get me? You know, if we understand the spiritual realm, we will become more effective on the physical realm. Okay? When we start discovering this principle, then it will help us change the way we how we do things and how we relate because or later we will become more focused on the root rather than the fruit you know we learn to see through in the heavenly realm our perspective change we will no longer fo focusing on the effect the end result but rather on the reason you know the cause as to why things are happening sometimes you are we we are more focused on the things that you know uh our spouse or our friends is doing, but we never realize what the root cause. And the root cause is the spiritual realm. The enemy is trying to deceive them, right? And as mentioned, having this knowledge in advance, you know, this inside information will help us go through our own situation. You know, as we stand strong, knowing the end result will be. And this is what Paul is trying to urge us to learn, to see things from the heavenly realm. You know, importantly, we need the spiritual sight. Now, can you ask your, the someone beside you, do you have a spiritual sight? Or just the physical sight, right? We need to have that, uh, what you call that, uh, wisdom or perception, you know, from the spiritual, in the spiritual wisdom. You know, in other words, you and I need to be able to see what is the enemy's doing. Do you know what the enemy is doing? Do we know what Satan is doing in our lives? You know, as a matter of fact, Paul say, says that we should not be ignorant of his schemes, uh, of his devices or his strategies or plans against us. And to emphasize this further, allow me to share some of the things that Satan do in our life. This way, we could understand better. Knowing the scheme of the enemy will help us win the battle, right? 
Uh, if you know if you know the tactics of your opponent, you have the tendency to win. And what are what are those skills of Satan? Understanding the enemy's tactic. Number one, he distracts, right? He wants to use anything and everything in our life. Normally good things that are subtle that we don't recognize. You know, sometimes we don't recognize that the enemy is already using this thing for us. Sometimes he's using our friend. Sometimes he's using our relative, right? You know, and this is to distract us slowly away from what, uh, from doing what God has called us to do. You know, to pull us away from our purpose. He makes a distraction. I may to be Number two, uh, he discouraged. He reminds us of things of our past. This is what the enemy is doing. He will tell you that uh, you know uh, all, all the things of your mistakes in the past, your failures, or this is who you are in the past, right? Uh, he wants to send people in our life with negative messages, you know, to simply say things to discourage us. Because he knows if he can keep us this. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Again, he discouraged us. Why he discouraged us? Because, like what I said, um, where are we? Because he knows if he can keep us discouraged, then he can keep us from from having the courage to to the things that God wants us to do. So that is what the enemy is doing in our life. He also discourages. He distracts. He discourages. Number three. What else? Discontent. You know, he causes discontent. Uh, he wants us to look at our life and say that you know there is something else better out there for me that I can do. So I don't like where I am right now. You know, the enemy will try to throw us off from where we are already satisfied of. You know, you know the enemy will, will sometimes whisper in your ear, ah, you could do something better. You know, ah, don't be set uh, for what you have. Don't strive for more. He will give you discontentment. What else? What, the enemy, what does the enemy or Satan do in our life? Come on. Divide. Yeah, he divides. He wants to create chaos in our relationship so that we don't have unity. Instead, we're just divided. And therefore, we don't have any power because we're trying to fight it alone. You know, rather than having people or a group of people around us to fight with us. He causes division not only inside the church, but also inside our home. So we have to be very careful. You know, we have to uh, we have to have uh, an eye that can see this. Oh, you know what, Pastor Adele? I can see that someone is already dividing our church. So that we have to stand firm because that is one of the scheme of the enemy. Number five, he put us down. You know, he puts us doubt. He wants to cause us doubt, doubt to God's word, doubt to God's promises, doubt to God's provision. And doubt just that God is simply good. Okay? So uh, that is what the enemy. And number six. What else? He deceives. Uh, through how, how does the enemy deceive us? Sometimes through doctrines. Through false doctrine, false teaching. You know, he thinks that if he can flood our mind with all sorts of false doctrines or teaching, he knows that. Wrong interpretation always leads to wrong application. So he causes deception. So we have to be very careful. And that's the reason why here in our church, this coming year, we will try to promote this is Bible year for MCL. Everyone will study the Word of God, hopefully in Bible studies. Okay. And lastly, this is what the, the enemy is doing. He destroyed. He wants to destroy our family. He wants to destroy our reputation. He wants to destroy our character. He wants to destroy our ministry, our business, and basically destroy everything that we have already spent our life building. He causes destruction. Right? So this is really important for us 
to have this kind of spiritual sight. No, that we could we could uh, identify and distinguish how the enemy is doing in our life. And this is in order for us to win the spiritual warfare. Okay, so Paul summoned us, okay, just to, to uh, uh, enumerate it again. He summoned us, number one, to be strong, to be suited by the armor of God, and number three, to be able to see through. Three S, okay, strong, suited, and see through. I hope you remember that. And uh, we need to understand uh, the summon. Let's move on now to our point number two, because that is our point number one. We need to understand the summon, and that is to stand firm in order for, for us to win the battle. Number two, second point, another way or another practical ways to win the battle, as I mentioned a while ago, we need uh, to use the spiritual suit. It's not only knowing that we have the spiritual suit, but using it or utilizing it. The full armor of God. Okay? Let us read verse 13 to 17. Okay, this is what it says. Uh, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of the evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Verse 16, In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How many How many armors do, do we see there? Six. How many? Six. Six, right? Okay. There are six armors listed in, in that verse that Apostle Paul gave us. But those six can be categorically classified into two types. Okay? Uh, listen, but at least we could understand this. Categorically, Paul divides the armor into two types as introduced by the way he uses two different verbs. Okay? The first three is introduced with the verb to be or having with. Right? Let me see. see that? There you go. See that? From verse 14, I highlight the word with, with, and with. Okay? So in the last three is introduced with the verb to take. Okay, take, take, okay? So, uh, Paul switches verb halfway through the armament because he wants us to understand two specific distinct orientations from these six pieces of armor. The first three relates to a state where we should always be in. No, like in a state of war, okay? Uh, there, these are the armor that we must wear all the time. We have as a standing foundation. And the last three is like, take it or bring it out as needed. Okay? Like during the actual attack. You now, this aspect of the armor, we take up from situation to situation or as the moment demands. We could think of those demanding moments in the spiritual warfare in that sense. Okay, remember sometimes when you are uh, when you are in the war, right? Sometimes we send troops in the war. They're always wearing their uniforms, right? But they don't always carry their guns. So the first three is some sort like a, 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 an armor that you have to always wear. But the succeeding three is something that you would take when there is an actual attack. Okay? Sorry. There you go. Uh, okay. So the first three needs to be set in order for one person to be, and the next three needs to be picked up as needed basis, specifically concerning the evil days. You know, the take on armament somehow seems to have some sort of special purpose in that sense. And again, I understand that we are all in a war environment. Every one of us is in the battle just being in a state of war with the enemy. But what does the evil day mean in terms of concerning the armor? Remember, we see that word, days of evil, right? So, evil days is when the enemy decided to launch his offensive attack, trying to destroy anything we might have. Like what I've said, you know, not all the times the enemy would 
like to strike you. There are times that he would strike you, right? Uh, special, you know, sometimes, oh, uh, like for example, uh, you fight husband and wife. Not every day you fight. So meaning not every day the enemy is trying to attack you. There are only certain days. Okay, so those are the two types of armor based on based on those uh, verses. Now let's try to look in and enumerate this six foot armor of God and describe each of them. You know, starting from the things we need to be in or to be with armor. Okay, so I'm looking at the clock. I want to be cautious about the clock, but I want you to understand every detail of it. I don't want you to miss the importance of the things that Paul is going to tell us. Number one, the belt of truth, okay? It's uh, found on verse 14. It says there, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. You know, Paul says that the first thing is the belt of truth. You know, we could talk about the Roman soldier's belt and other things that he could hook into it and all that, but in a spiritual warfare, what does truth really means. Okay, what is truth really means? Biblically speaking, truth may be defined as an absolute reality, an absolute standard by which reality is measured. Wow, that's heavy word, right? Uh, truth may be defined as an absolute reality, an absolute standard by which reality is measured. Truth is simply God's view on any subject, period. There's no other truth rather than oh, from God's, uh, God's point of view. Truth is more than feeling. In fact, truth is more than facts. We can have the facts and not have the truth at all. Right? Oh, I, 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 you know, uh, I don't know how to describe this, but uh, uh, many times people get stuck on facts and never arrive on the truth. They do not get uh, the solution. The thing is, it is not the truth that sets you free. Siguro, some of you might raise your eyebrow. What did you say, Pastor Adel? Okay, let me repeat that. You, uh, the thing is that truth... Uh, where, where did I say that? The thing is that it's not the truth that sets you free, but listen to me, but it is the truth that you know that sets you free. Okay? It, what? The applied. Okay, the applied truth. That's right. You know, it, it, it said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Right? That is the whole context of the, bird, the verse. You shall know the truth. First, you need to know the truth so that in order for that truth to become effective or beneficial to your life, my point is, truth is always there. But unless we discover it, it will not set us free. It will not bring us any value. The truth is represented by the belt or tied up with the belt, which technically speaking, is not part of the armor. But before the armor can be put on the garments underneath, it must be gathered together. Belt is no mere adornment, but an essential part of his equipment. Similarly to the truth, uh, it used to keeping all the parts in place. You know, theologically speaking, the belt of truth puts on the biblical beliefs of the Christian as a whole. You know, the truth is basically the things that binds all our, you know, the things that all the things that we learn, right? The things that we study. We we base everything on truth. Okay? Number two, the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 14 says that stand firm with the breastplate of righteousness in place. You know, righteousness is represented as a breastplate which provides essential protection to the body, right? You now, righteousness, listen to this, is not something that we earn. Okay? It is not something that we can own. It is not even a feeling of being righteous, but more so it's doing the right thing for the right reason without any offense. Okay, listen to this. It is not about how we sing it rightfully in tune, but rather 
by why we are singing it. Did you get it? Did you catch it? You know, it is not about how we sing it rightfully in June, but rather why we are singing it. You know, the thing is, the world has ruined or corrupted the meaning much as it has dissolved and has deceived many. Righteousness is not a privilege. Okay? It is not self-entitlement. Listen to this. But it is a state in our character. Okay? We cannot say, okay, it is my right you know, to, be, to be righteous. No, it is not an entitlement. Righteousness is not a privilege. It's not, uh, it is a state in our character knowing uh, that what we think or do serve a good purpose for others and not for ourselves. Righteousness is ethical, compassionate, loving, and purposely kind. You know, a good example of righteousness, you know, I've been explaining to you what is righteousness, but I guess this is the best way to describe the meaning of righteousness. Romans chapter 14, verse 13, and verse 15 to 21. What is righteousness? Uh, this is what Paul said. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this. Look at this. Not to put a stumbling block or cause to, uh, to fall in, one, in our brother's way. Look at verse 15. If your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Look at this. Do not destroy with your food the one from whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good, hey, listen to this, what is he referring? Do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Okay? For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in this thing is acceptable to God and approved by men. Okay, Pastor Adel, what are you trying to say here? You know, Paul in this case is talking about food and drink. Right? He's saying for the sake of our brothers not to fall or stumble, what is he saying? We must abstain. He's saying that righteousness, peace, and joy is more important than food and drinks which represent our personal need. Okay? He's saying that it is acceptable to God. Basically, what Paul is saying is that even though we think we are right, even though that we are not doing anything wrong, but because of our compassion and care for others, we have to take it into consideration. Meaning, it's not wrong to, to eat, you know, ginuguan, but because, you know, I know it's my right and there's nothing wrong with it. It's right to eat the food, right? But because my brother would be stumbled when I eat it or when I drink something, then even though I'm right, I have to give way. That is righteousness. Being considerate, not to yourselves, but to others first. Okay? We have to be considerate and kind for the benefits of others. To put into account the welfares of others. It is, you know, it is, you know, I, I've been hearing, sometimes we could hear people say, as long as I don't stumble people, I don't step on other people's toe, I will do this. Right? But that is not what the Bible is teaching us. Right? Again, the Bible is teaching us, be considerate. So in order uh, for us to do the righteous thing, the, let me suggest this. First, we think about God. If we're going to, to do something, let's think about God first. What would God think or would say if I do this. Number two, second, we have to think about others, the majority, the congregation. Okay? Uh, if I'm going to do this in my social media account, what would the church would say about Pastor Adel? Right? I have to put that in consideration. Even though I'm not doing anything wrong, I have to consider all of you. Number three, third, I have to think about ours, the minority, meaning the small group. If I'm going to do, I'm, 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 if I'm going to do this, what would my family or my friend would say? And lastly, if we want to do the, the righteous thing, then we could think about ourselves. God first, others next, 
and then ask the last. Okay? So that is just a suggestion. Okay? We have to be, the, the big word is let's be considerate. That is being righteous. It's not about it's my privilege, it's not about you know my self-entitlement, but it is being considerate. Number three. Uh, number three. The feet pitted of the gospel of peace. Okay? Uh, stand firm with your feet pitted with the, the, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You know, at this point, Paul is telling the importance of peace that the gospel brings. Okay? You know, I've heard this so many times. Some people will say that the feet represent a person travels and thus means that everywhere he goes, he needs to share the gospel. No, you know they, they represent the peace. Uh, you know, you know, you, you need to share the gospel. But actually, the bigger subject in, in this verse is the word peace, right? Uh, like what I said, that might be true about you know sharing the gospel. But I think that is more than what Paul is trying to convince us here. I think it is more being ready to be at peace as a result of the gospel to us. No, the feet feeted of the gospel of peace. Meaning, in order for you to, to win the battle, you need to have that feet that you should always be ready to be peaceful. Right? Peaceful that was brought by the gospel or the, 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 the word of God to you. No? Uh... But really, how do we understand peace? How much peace does the gospel affect us? What I'm saying is, um, if, if there is, okay, let, let, me, let me just give you this illustration. One day, painter were asked to paint a picture of peace. And one painted, uh, this, this painting, a magnificent picture of calm and shepherd leading uh, the sheep by the water, and it was such a calming environment. You know, it's very peaceful. There was the horizon of the sun setting, and the water was still, and called it peace. And another painter painted a picture, and it was like this. It was a torrential rain, lightning shooting across the sky. It was dark, and the water was turbulent. There was chaos everywhere. Except, come on, there was at the corner of the painting, there was a little bird on the rock sitting and singing uh, with notes coming out of its mouth and the silver of light coming through the storm resting on it. Actually, that is biblical peace. Meaning, despite of whatever took place, we will not be moved. We will not be shaken, but rather standing firm. No, biblical peace is the way you know, uh, the way you know that you have biblical peace is that not because nothing is wrong, it is more that it is because everything is wrong and you're still singing. No, it is when the Holy Spirit confirms our direction by peace because the gospel does more than get us into heaven. Listen to this, the gospel does more than get us into heaven. But moreover, the gospel brings heaven to us. Did you, did you get me? You know, it, it is not the gospel bringing us to heaven, but the gospel of peace, it means the gospel bringing us heaven to us. And that is what the Lord has told us, right? In John chapter 16, verses 33, it says here, These things I have spoken to you that in me, what? You may have peace in the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That's the Lord, that's the Lord Jesus Christ telling them. You know, and this is what Paul is telling us. To win the battle, we need to be in truth, in righteousness, and in peace. That should be state, that should be the state of our inner character. We need to be with, we need to be wearing it all the time. We need to have peace all the time. We need to have uh, uh, the, <laughs> the truth all the time and righteousness all the time. Okay? 
Now let's look at the things that we need to carry. And this is what I was telling you the last three. Uh, okay, I still have. Okay, the six lang naman yan. It's only six, so this is the fourth one. Uh, the shield of faith. Okay, in addition to this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I think everyone can visualize what a shield is, right? Yung pananga. Paul is saying that if we carry the shield of faith, it will help us extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, I was thinking, why it needs to be flaming? Why can it just be a simple arrow? Right? Why, 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 why put fire on the arrow? Right? Uh, actually, in real battle, a fiery arrow was not meant to shoot an enemy directly. They don't need fire on an arrow to kill an enemy. The fiery arrow instead was used to shoot the canvas of a wagon or the hut of the house because they understand that doing it so would make the other opponents have a hard time combating. You know, the fire and the enemy at the same time. In a way, they used this as a tactic to create diversion, to create chaos and divide the attention. You know, the same way the enemy works. He tried to pierce us directly with a fiery arrow, not to kill us, but to distract us, just like what I told you a while ago. If he can shoot us directly, he, he find another target to get our attention. You know, but Paul said that the shield of faith is able to overcome and withstand the fiery arrow, because he said that if we move in sync with our faith, with truth and righteousness, and confirm by peace that we have, then our faith overcomes darkness. You know, in short, it is through our faith that we are protected from the chaotic things that is happening around the world. You know, if we have faith, regardless of what people are doing or what the world is even all these virus things is happening if we have faith you know we will not be in chaos right of course we need to be safe um, uh, the thing is this is the thing that keep us grounded the faith hey okay, let me move to number five there's only six right and besides come on yeah, the helmet of salvation Take the helmet of salvation. The helmet covers the head where the head covers the brain. But the brain is to the body, but the mind is to the soul. Dealing with the way we think. You know, I say the mind because everybody's soul has been distorted by sin and circumstances. Okay, what is the importance of the brain or the mind? And uh, let me give you this illustration. I don't know. Uh, did you touch this at the same uh, this is uh, <laughs> during the 60s uh, I found this um, internet art article when I was watching uh, Pastor Tony Evans message that there was this comedy sitcom uh, in CBS TV station entitled The Beverly Hillbillies okay this is a story of a man named Jed who worked hard just to keep his family fed. But one day while shooting rabbit uh, for some food, accidentally he shoot the ground and discovered the ground came up bubbling with crude oil. Okay, so they make a discovery of crude oil. And that makes Jed Clampett, the name of the character from that story, become a mega millionaire alongside with his family. You know, technically speaking, they have always been a millionaire since they owned that property. But listen to this. It's just that they didn't know. Everything they needed to live wealthy life had already been imparted when they owned the property. They just don't know. They never thought of that because of their thinking is limited on what they could see in the hills of Tennessee. They never knew that all the while there is a big fortune underneath the land where they were living. So they did not discover. But again, this is a comedy sitcom. The funny and the interesting thing is that when they moved from Tennessee, 
they moved to Beverly Hills, the comedy was about a mega, the mega millionaires which are still living like hillbillies in the Beverly Hills. In short, they had not learned to live up to their new position. No, they moved to Beverly Hills, the place of the rich and the famous, but they are still living like still in Tennessee, still acting like folks living in the suburb. What's the point? Sadly, this is the same thing happening to us or to some of us. As Christians, we have been elevated to the heavenly place along with every believers. But the problem is that some of us are still operating like we are limited to the earthly place. So we become self-limiting even though we've been relocated already. God has given us all the authority already. We just simply have to claim and know. And that, this is the reason why I was telling you a while ago, when I was watching the Pacquiao fight, it's better that you already know what's going to happen. Because the truth of the matter is, you know, the Bible already tells us that we are all victorious, but most of us are still living like losers. Okay, I'm not pinpointing anyone here, right? God has already given us the authority from heaven, but still we choose the things we use to live by the earth. We focus more on the physical and visible and neglecting the spiritual invincible that has far more value. God through Apostle Paul says that if we pick up the helmet of salvation, you know, this, in other words, we bring up our thinking in line with God's thinking. We don't think down here, but we think up here, the way God, God's thing, right? Uh, I remember uh, Pastor, uh, I forgot his name, Ray Puentes, right? He said that, you know, as it is in heaven, you know, we, we operate here as it is in heaven. So we have to elevate ourselves. We need to elevate our thinking, our mindset. Let me go, let me go now to my last point. Uh, the helmet of salvation, and the last point is, come on, the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Paul goes to the only offensive weapon. This is the only offensive weapon. It goes to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, the idea is that the Spirit provides the sword for us, and that sword is the Word of God. Question. Why would he only give us one offensive weapon? Why only one? Why he didn't give us like a, an axe or a chisel or you know other stuff? It could could it be that everything else in place it's really all you need? Is it it is the sword of the spirit, you know, because it is the only weapon the spirit uses. You know, sadly, not everyone who believes in the Bible, which represents the sword of the Spirit, treats the Bible like an authority. You know, to effectively use the sword, we must regard it as the Word of God, which is the Word of God. If we are not confident in the inspiration of the Scripture, that the sword really comes from the Spirit, then we won't be able to use it effectively. You know, if we, if we think that the Bible is just some sort of like a, an, another book, then it will, not, it will not benefit us. We have to elevate our thinking about the Word of God. You know, uh, how we use the Word of God. In the Bible, there are three cl classifications used by scholars to distinguish the Word of God based on its form and in use. I don't want to go technical, but uh, let me just simply give you the, those three. The first one is they call it grappa, which is the written word, okay? Then there is logos, which is the compiled structure of the Bible. But neither of them is what Paul is describing here. Paul is describing here the word rema. Rema meaning it is the utterance or the declared or spoken word of God. He said, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is the word being used in this condition being used in the battle. 
Okay? So again, in order to win the battle, we need to use the suit, the armor of God. That is point number two. When these six pieces of armor are in place, then we are operating from the heavenly place, not on earthly place. And with that comes authority. My question to each and every one of you is, how do you put on all this equipment? Are we wearing them? Okay, let me move on to my last and short point. Okay, those are Rema examples. Okay? Uh, the first one, understand the Samoan. Number two, use the suit. And number three, utter a supplication. Look at verse 18. It says there, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So that is the third practical things that we can do to win the battle. Paul is saying that we should always be in sync with the Holy Spirit in all occasions. Alert and praying not only for ourselves, but also for everyone. Why? Because we are all team. Okay? We are all team here. Your pain is my pain. My pain is your pain. Right? Prayer is an earthly permission for heavenly intervention. It is like claiming down our authority. It is claiming down our rights and our uh, privileges. Because this battle is talking about, this is why he called us to call him heavenly. Okay. So, again, First, to understand the summon, to stand here. Number two, I'm just recapping. Use the spiritual suit, the armor of God. And lastly, the short one, utter the supplication. You know, prayer, it is very important. Uh, okay. It is through prayer that our spiritual strength and spiritual armor go to work. Without prayer, those things will not work. Okay? It is through prayer that ignite our strength and the effectivity of the armor. So that is very important. Okay? It is just like the, 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 the gas in the car. You have the car, but without prayer, it would not move. Okay? That's how you analyze it. So let me now jump into my conclusion. Okay? You know, unfortunately, many people did not realize that everything is done, that the battle has already been won. The truth is, it is. In the letter of Paul to the Colossians, uh, in chapter 2, he gave us all this statement, and I like to leave this thing out, uh, and I like to echo this, you know, uh, a step that, you know, we could learn from Paul speaking here. This is what he said. Uh, and this is what I would like to do. So it says here, So then just as you receive Christ, all of us receive Christ, right? As the Lord continue to live your lives in Him, what, what did He say? Rooted and be built up in Him, strengthened in the faith, as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Verse 8, See that uh, to Him that no one takes you captive. Okay? Do not be a loser. Okay? That's what He said. Through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual force of this world rather than on Christ. Why? For Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. We are all complete. We are all victorious. We are all triumphant. Right? He is the head over every power and authority. Christ did it. Right? And having this on the powers, and authorities, he made public spectacle of them. Look at this. Triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. It's done. Okay? We are just watching the replay. God has already won it. Okay? So we don't have to be stumbled. We can now stand firm. Okay? Uh, at this point, if we, uh, if we have won it already, then why did the Apostle Paul need to teach us this lesson? Answer, because many among us, though we have been elevated already in the heavenly realm, 
still lives in the limited earthly authority. Now, meaning God already informed us about the end day, though most of the time, we never look at it that way. Or sometimes, we see it halfway. Now, like Manny Pacquiao, we will all be hurt during the rounds. But in the end, we will all come victorious. Knowing how we utilize the armor will help us minimize the pain. So let's continue to face the battle ahead this year. Let us continue to stand for God, fight for Him, as we put the armor of God, praying that He will give us the authority against all principalities, not only for ourselves, but for everyone else as well. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father God, Lord, once again, we thank you for, for reminding us, Lord God, that it's already done, that you have already won the battle, that we could live victoriously and triumphantly already, Lord God. Forgive us, Lord God, if sometimes we don't elevate ourselves to the heavenly realm, but focus more on the earthly things. And Lord, teach us to wear the arm, the full armor, Lord God, and help us to distinguish the attacks of the enemy. Lord, thank you, because we know that we are all victorious already. And trust everything to you in Jesus' name. Amen.